to present the Golden Eddy to Steven Spielberg, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kathleen Kennedy. <laughs> I'm here to honor along with you, Steven Spielberg. I share with the ace in acknowledging Steven's career as being indelibly woven into the fabric of our culture. When he asked me if I would present this award, I didn't hesitate. In fact, the idea that it was you, the editors, giving Steven this award made it all the more appealing. The editing room has always held a special place for me in the filmmaking process. When I began working with Stephen in 1978 on the movie 1941, I was asked to deliver, I was asked to deliver something to Stephen in the cutting room at Todd A.O. When I arrived, there was a flurry of activity and someone greeted me at the door. They took the delivery, but they made no attempt to invite me in. What I came to realize was that the editing room was a sanctuary, impenetrable by no one other than those most trusted by Stephen and Michael. During Raiders of the Lost Ark, I was allowed to enter the editing room one day, and I had an overwhelming sense of privilege. I didn't initially know why it was such a big deal, but I later came to understand that the cutting room represented an environment of mutual trust and safety. Stephen gets credit for making hugely successful popular entertainment. In many ways, he invented the modern vocabulary for that kind of storytelling. But what people don't give him credit for is the number of times in his career that he has reinvented himself. That constant change over these last four decades is what defines him. Whatever the movie demands, he becomes that director. And you can always tell a Spielberg film in that it always reflects the spirit of those whom Stephen has brought into the process. Over the years, I have watched a continuity of spirit also permeate the editing room through the assistants that Stephen and Michael have mentored. Billy Goldenberg, for instance, nominated not for one but two Academy Awards this year. Bruce Green and Alan Cody. Each of them represent the continuity of spirit that I know that Stephen takes great pride in each of their successes. There were several images that flooded my memory when thinking about working with Stephen and Michael through these years. Probably the most significant being root beer drops. Root beer drop candies have always been important staple in, in Stephen's cutting room. They have also in many ways framed a sense of change. Sadly, as of this year, Reed's no longer is making root beer drops. <laughs> Just as Kodak is no longer making film. <laughs> Change is constant in film, and Stephen has always been a filmmaker keen to embark on new adventures. He actually seeks out what he doesn't know. Often people suffer while waiting for change to happen, but not Stephen. He waits for change to reveal the starting place. He held out as long as he possibly could with electronic editing, but when they stopped making splicing tape and Pat Crane was having trouble finding trained assistants, he, he shifted seamlessly, announcing finally he was ready to say goodbye to the chem. This year, as I rounded the corner of a 35-year th collaboration with Stephen, we found ourselves making one of the most daring films of his career, Lincoln. It is not often that he will turn to me and say, I don't know what I'm doing. There's so much talking, so much dialogue. How am I going to make this suspenseful and, and engaging? Each day, however, at lunch, he would emerge from the cutting room after spending time in the safety of its sanctuary with renewed enthusiasm 
and confidence to carry on. To carry on. Lincoln was shot on film, but cut on, on an avid, and the last pack of root beer drops was consumed as Stephen once again reinvented himself. And I'm sure along with everyone in this room, we can't wait to see what he turns to next. Please join me in looking at the root beer drop legacy of Steven Spielberg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, well. That was really intimidating watching those film clips. Uh, um, and I, it's interesting because I. I, I an editor obviously put those film clips together, and I like how all the transitions were like the, the bicycle wheels and the car wheels and all those transitions. I noticed that stuff. That's, that's great stuff. Um, let me first of all thank Kathy Kennedy. Uh, we've been together, uh, 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 you know, a long time, a long time. And, uh, and Kathy was just a kid when uh, she was first starting out. And I was just a kid uh, when I was first starting out. And, you know, when I was first starting uh, out before anybody would hire me, before I had a job, uh, the only people that would give me any um, advice and let me hang out with them were the editors. They were, they were the only ones that would really, uh, uh, you know, let me watch the process, watch the construction of TV shows in the 60s. And I used to hang out at Universal Studios with the editors. Um, and it was really interesting. The first thing I noticed was that the editors were always complaining that because of the television schedules, they had no coverage. You know, these directors had to go out and get eight to 10 to 11 pages a day, and they only were able to shoot a couple of close-ups, uh, a master that never went through the entire scene, and a couple of over-shoulders that never went through the entire scene. Um, and leaving most of the time, uh, film editors uh, a kind of, you know, adrift because of lack of coverage. And, and I remember, um, I was watching an episode of a lawyer series that was being uh, edited, um, and the guest star, and I'm not going to mention the name of the guest star, but he had a big important speech. It was a final summation to uh, a jury, but this actor could not remember any of his dialogue, none of it. And, and there were off-camera voices that were calling out the lines. And, and, and I was very, very embarrassed for the editor uh, uh, because, uh, you know, he was in his late 60s and he was chain smoking. And he was just sort of staring at what he had to work with. It was the raw materials. It was raw materials. Um, and, and, and I really, and bless this editor's heart uh, for taking me step by step through um, what he had right then determined was going to be the solution. Um, so what he did was he dumped the picture of this actor. He got rid of the picture. And he took the soundtrack. And um, he assembled the entire two-minute monologue by cutting out all the parts where the actor was forgetting his lines, and the actor was saying things like, you know, I'm sorry, oh shit, fuck me, things like that. <laughs> and he cut all, all those parts out. Uh, until he reconstituted the entire monologue out of about 40 pieces of fragmented soundtrack. And then he went back to the entire show and he used this monologue, this summation to the jury over flashbacks of all the scenes that we've already seen to prove that this lawyer's client was not guilty of the crime. And, and, and this is back in the late 60s and I thought at the time that this was really insanely inventive because this didn't seem like 60s TV to me. And he made this work, he made this avant-garde idea work because necessity as we all know, is the mother of invention. And a few weeks later, when I went back into the cutting room and talked to Tony, he, 
you know, I came back to see how everybody liked his idea, and he told me that they all just simply hated it. <laughs> and, and, and the producers simply called the actor back and they reshot the monologue. <laughs> After all that. But I'm telling you this story because when I look back now, um, I realize that when I was 19 years old, hanging out at the Uni Universal Studios editorial, that was my film school. That was my USC. That was my UCLA. That was my NYU. Um, and I tell the kids, a lot of kids who I meet through the years who desperately want to direct, to take a film that they think they know really, really well and watch it again with the sound turned completely off to really understand how the director and how the editor have constructed the visual narrative because editing and directing are almost interchangeable. You know, on, on, on the set, uh, because we really do have enough time, even on a big budgeted movie, uh, to do everything we, we want to do with the script, um, we have to eventually lock our choices down. We have, a, have to eventually commit and do it in a way. But in editing, as you all know, all the different ways that we can reinvent our stories and at the same time reinvent ourselves are incalculable. And I've always looked at the editing room as the safe haven of second chances. So if, if directing is an art form, then film editing is a fine art form and it's the final and it's the most important stage in turning something good into something great. Because editors, everybody here, you are my heroes. We, we speak the same language, we speak the same language even while we're trying to reinvent the language of film uh, and television. And, and some of you have been very inspired working with your directors, and I suppose you've also worked with directors that make you wonder why you are not directing. Um, <laughs> you've, you've learned from a lot of talented collaborators, and you've suffered fools when certain executives who have better taste in clothes than in making comments about your work try their hand. <laughs> But, you know, in the end, if you really are free uh, to explore your art and to explore your craft, the cutting room is where we make the ends meet, it's where the magic multiplies or gets lost in the shuffle. And no matter how chaotic or how harmonious the cutting room experience has been, there is no greater partner to have than all of you. And in my individual case, that partner for the last 27 years, 37 years, 37 years, has been the great Michael Kahn. Michael, there's no possible way I could be standing up here tonight receiving this tremendous honor, honor from the American Cinema Editors without what you have done for my life and for my, uh, for my work. Thank you, Mike. And I also, I want to thank my whole group right there and I want to thank uh, uh, Jessica and Destry, my oldest and youngest member of my family, and my wife, Kate, and they're all here to share this moment with all of us. Frank and Kathy and, and, and Billy, who has uh, assisted us for so many years. Uh, uh, Billy, we're, I'm so proud of you, everything you've done, and congratulations on two Eddie nominations tonight. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.